Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So uh, just a little background. I uh, recently became Adventist about two and a half years ago. And um, uh, he was born out of wedlock. And, um, and so we did a horrible job of raising him. We did a lot of neglecting. And, but once we, we came to God, God just worked miracles in him. And um, the day I got baptized, my husband got rebaptized. And we dedicated our son that same day. And my son went like this to the pastor. He wanted to say something to the congregation. And he said, the most important thing is that we must walk by, fa uh, by faith and not by sight. And so since then, um, Mike Carter, if any of you know him, he was like, that little man's going to be a preacher. And so, so uh, Mike Carter put together a group of kids. Uh, he, uh, Tristan is the youngest. And he uh, put together a, a prophecy series, and we're actually finishing it today at Central Valley. But um, so this sermon is the first of the series, and it has it has been a blessing. God God is really good. So here's Tristan. Welcome to our welcome to the first sermon of Game of Thrones, Job and the Book of Revelation. Some of you may be wondering why we put Job and Revelation together. Let me ask you this. How many of you have heard of a man in the Bible named Job? Job went through some pretty rough times, didn't he? Lost his businesses, kids, and even his own health. Really tough, huh? Well, did you know that a lot of the things that we find in Revelation come directly from the book of Job. Those of us who are living in the last days are going to have Job-like experiences. So that's what we're going to be doing in this series. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit make speak through me, and hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, let's begin. Job chapter 1 starts off by informing us that Job was a good man who loved God and avoided evil. But it was his loyalty to God that got him in trouble. You see, according to the book of Job, a special meeting took place in heaven. The sons of God, a term that the Bible uses to describe beings from other worlds, were at this meeting in heaven. The Bible also tells us Satan was there too. Now what was Satan doing at this council? Doesn't the Bible tell us that Satan was kicked out of heaven? Well, he was kicked out. But according to the Bible, he was allowed to attend these special meetings in heaven. For this reason, Adam, who is also referred to in the Bible as a son of God, was supposed to be present at this special council in heaven. You see, in the book of Genesis, we discover that Adam and Eve were our first parents, and that God actually made them to be the president and the CEO of planet Earth. But when Satan, in the form of a snake, tricked Adam and Eve to turn against God by eating fruit from the forbidden tree that God told them not to eat, Satan became the new ruler the new representative of planet Earth. And using this planet as a base, he sought to not only get back into heaven, but amazingly, according to the Bible, to take control of the throne in heaven. Now you might be thinking to yourself, that's really crazy. Why didn't God just kill Satan and get it over with? My friends, the reason for this is obvious. God could have snuffed out Lucifer easier than you and I can step on a cucaracha. 
That's cockroach in Spanish for those who speak in Spanish. But if he had done that, the unfallen universe would, would have immediately begun questioning whether Lucifer might have had a point. God didn't want that. So in order to give Satan a fair hearing and to prevent anarchy with the other beings, God allowed Satan to challenge him. So we find Satan in the book of Revelation refers to as the accuser. When he was at this council, accusing God of being an unjust and corrupt ruler. But the way he did this is interesting. He sought to convince the other representatives from the other worlds that none of the inhabitants on the planet Earth really trusted God. Now, why would he make that a strong point? Did you know that according to the Bible, mankind is the only being made in God's image? What that means is that you and I were made to be more godlike than any other being in the universe. So Satan's argument to these representatives was this. If humans who are made in God's image don't trust him, well, that just proves that none of us can trust him either. You need a leader you can trust. I, not God, should be on the throne. So we find God asking Satan this question. Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth. He is perfect. He is upright. He respects me and he avoids evil. And Satan replies, the only reason you respect him is that you've spoiled him and given him everything he wants. I guarantee you, God, take all those things away, make life miserable, and your boy Job will curse you to your face. Mm. So we find, so God allows Satan to test Job with one stipulation. Don't kill him. And so Job gets tested in a variety of ways. Let's just look at three of those ways and notice how they line up with the book of Revelation. First, fire comes down from heaven and destroys all of Job's property, his sheep, his cattle, and his donkeys. Interestingly, in Revelation 13, we find Satan sending fire from heaven in the last days in an effort to deceive and destroy those who are loyal to God. Secondly, Satan used a woman Job's wife, to try to induce Job to curse God. In Revelation 17, Satan also uses a woman called the harlot of Babylon, which are, we are going to find out later is a symbol of a church to try and force God's people to curse God. Thirdly, Satan used four of Job's close friends to try to break down his resistance and discourage him. In the same way as we find in Revelation that there are four dragon-like beasts that are used by Satan to break down God's people in the last days, these beasts, according to Revelation, all come under the title of a system that John refers to as Babylon the Great. And this is where we begin our prophetic journey today in a place called Babylon. Now Babylon was a real city in ancient times. In fact, does anyone know what country ancient Babylon sits on today? That's correct, Iraq. Here's a map of Iraq. Do any of you recognize any of the cities on the map? Yep. Our American soldiers shed their blood to secure some of these places. In Daniel 2, we are told about a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had one evening. The amazing thing about this dream is that it took place 500 years before Jesus was born. In this dream, Nebuchadnezzar is given the outline of world history for the next 2,500 years. Many people who have studied this have been amazed 
at how accurate Bible prophecy really is. The Bible tells us, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the king had a dream that really bothered him. And when it was over, he shot straight out of bed, but he couldn't remember the dream. However, however, he knew it was important, so he called together his wise men and asked them to help him figure out the dream. Now, who were these wise men? According to the Bible, they were astrologers, magicians, and psychics. All of these guys claimed to have supernatural abilities, by the way. They stood before the king and said to him, Tell us to dream, O king, and we will tell you what it means. So the king replied, That's the problem. I know this was an important dream. But I can't remember what it was about. So you gotta help me figure out what I dream and what it means. Have you ever had a dream that you couldn't remember? Well, that's why King Nebuchadnezzar was agitated. These wise men said to the king, now king, let's be reasonable. Nobody in the kingdom can possibly tell you what you dreamed last night. Only the gods whose dwelling is not with men can reveal to you what your dreams are. And now the wise men were in deep trouble. And you know why? How many of you remember this guy, Saddam Hussein? Did you know that Saddam Hussein, like his forefather Nebuchadnezzar, couldn't tolerate people telling him that he was being unreasonable? In fact, if you didn't tell Saddam Hussein exactly what he wanted here, you would end up losing these. Because Adam, Saddam Hussein was given order to have your ears chopped off. Nebuchadnezzar was paying his wise men lots of money because he claimed to be in touch with the gods. And if they claimed to have special connection with the gods, but they couldn't tell the king his dream, what did that make them? A bunch of phonies! <laughs> the king was so angry, he made a decree that every wise man in Babylon shall be killed immediately. Now Daniel, a Hebrew and a man of God, along with his three friends, were considered to be part of the king's wise men, by the way. And even though they weren't part of the group that were summoned to the king's bed that night, the death decree applied to them as well. So Daniel asked the chief executioner, why is the king in such a rush to kill us all? Ask him to give us 24 hours, that's a whole day, and we will tell the king his dream. So what do you think Daniel and his three friends did when they got home? They prayed. See, my friends, if you're having problems in your life, no fortune teller, psychic, astrological rating, or fortune cookie that is going to be able to help you. The only reason, the only person who can help you solve your problems is God. When we're having problems, the first thing we need to do is pray to the God of heaven, like Daniel and his three friends did. So what do you think Daniel did after he prayed? He went to sleep. And it was while he was sleeping that the Lord revealed to Daniel the king's dream. The next morning, Daniel went before the king and told him exactly what he had dreamed the night before. He said, you, O king, had a dream about a statue that was composed of four different metals. Gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And three of this metal man were made of iron and clay. And at the end of your dream, there was a stone that came and crushed the statue. By now, the king was shocked. 
Yes, yes, he says. That's exactly what I dreamed last night. What does it mean? Daniel continued. You are this head of gold. The golden head of the statue was the nation of Babylon. Some scholars believe that Babylon had more gold in it than does Fort Knox in Kentucky. At that point, the king got a big smile on his face. He liked the thought that his kingdom was pictured as the head of all kingdoms upon the earth. But then his smile disappeared. As Daniel informed him in verse 39, after these shall arise another kingdom. History tells us that after the golden reign of Babylon, the Persians, represented by chest and arms of silver, will become the next world ruler. Interestingly, the Persians, even to this day, are known as superb silver smiths. And they conquered Babylon in the year 539 BC. Let's continue. Then after the Persians, another third kingdom of bronze, Greeks, under the direction of Alexander the Great, conquered Medo-Persia in the year 331 BC. Now notice the metal that was used to represent Greeks. Just like Babylon was full of gold and Persia full of silver, all the weapons that the Greeks used in their army were made of bronze. And Daniel continues, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. History tells us that the iron monarchy of Rome conquered the Greeks in the year four in the year 168 BC. Once again, all of Rome's weapons were made of iron. And then Daniel said, and just as he saw the feet and toes, the Roman kingdom shall be divided. Just as the statue had 10 toes, so shall there be 10 dominant kingdoms that will arise to make up what will eventually become known as Western Europe. Here's a list of those tribes. The Alemanni became Germany, the Franks became France, the Anglo-Saxons became England, the Lombards became Italy, the Burgundians became Switzerland, the Visigoths became Spain, the Suebi became Portugal, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Hurli disappeared. Now this prophecy is so accurate that for years, for years, the Bible critics claimed that the book of Daniel was a fake, that it could have been written when it was. But in 1946, somebody found these. You know what these are? That's good. That's very right. The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove at the very least that the book of Daniel, where this prophecy is listed, existed at least around the time of Christ. And yet, even during Christ's time of the hundreds of little nomadic tribes that roamed over the face of Western Europe, how did the prophet know that the ten of these tribes would arise to dominate the Roman Empire? Furthermore, the prophecy said the nations represented by the ten tribes would try to stick together by intermarriage, but that the kingdom would remain divided. For hundreds of years, the European countries tried, tried to stick together by intermarriage. One king would give his son or daughter to marry the son or daughter of another king, hoping that this would make peace, but it didn't work. In fact, did you know that Queen Victoria of England was the grandmother of every single monarch in Europe? And yet even that couldn't keep all the cousins from fighting each other. Why? Because the prophecy said the kingdom would remain divided. Napoleon tried to unite Europe, and he came 
awfully close, but he failed at Waterloo. Every computer simulation of Waterloo showed that Napoleon should have won that battle. Why didn't he? Because God told the prophet that a kingdom would remain divided. Hitler tried to unite Western Europe, and he almost did it, but he got stuck at Dunkirk. Historians refer to this as the miracle of Dunkirk. Did you know that Hitler's army had almost 400,000 British soldiers backed up against the English Channel in a place called Dunkirk? And the next day, he was planning on swooping down and wiping them out. If he had managed to do that, then Hitler would have united all of Europe. But what didn't God instruct Daniel, the prophet, to tell the king? The kingdom would remain divided. And so just as God did with the children of Israel, when they had their backs to the Egyptian army, while in front of them was the Red Sea, he put a dense fog between the British and the German armies. And on the German side, a heavy downpour of rain to prevent the German Air Force, Luftwaffe, from bombing the army from the air. This was, a time, this was a time of year when the English Channel is usually choppy and can be difficult to cross. But for nine days, the water was unseasonably calm, giving the British enough time to send over almost 900 vessels, little and big ships and boats, across the Channel to pick those stranded soldiers. And nine days later, when the rain stopped, the fog lifted, and the Germans were ridding themselves for the kill. They discovered that the entire British army had disappeared right under their noses. Why? Because God told the prophet the kingdom would remain divided. Here's the part where it gets serious. My friends... Why did God give us this prophecy? Because he wanted us to know that the same God that is in control of history is also in control of your salvation. And if you want to be saved, all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and he'll save you. How many of you tonight are willing to say, Lord, I am a sinner and I need help. My life is a wreck. My life is a mess. I'm a wreck but I'm making a decision right now to give Jesus a chance. My friends, I want you to come forward. Come on, my friends, don't delay. Because the Bible tells us that today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That right now is the day of salvation, because tomorrow might be too late. My friends, the next part of the vision shall give us pause. Because in it, Daniel saw a stone come straight out of heaven. And that stone, a symbol of Jesus, crushed the statue and ground it in the powder. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the rock of all ages and that he's coming soon. He's coming because he wants to take you home. But he's not going to force you to go with him. you got to make a decision. you got to accept Jesus. My friends, everything in our world is informing us that something stupendous is about to take place. We see things getting worse and worse, and we wonder why Jesus hasn't come yet. Well, did you know that, according to the Bible, that Jesus could have come before the Korean War or the Vietnam or Iraq War? He could have come before there was an outbreak of AIDS in the world or before Presidents Obama or Trump were elected. But he didn't, because he was waiting for you. The Bible tells us in Peter's second epistle that he is not willing that any should perish. That any is you. And so I'm waiting for you to get on your feet. Yes, I mean you. You know who I'm referring to. And at this time, I was invite my dad to play. Let's 
please bow our heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know a storm is coming. Lord, but we also know that you have created an ark that we are to be in. You are that ark, Lord. And so we ask you, Lord, and those that have come forward, that you come into our hearts, that you change us from within, that you get us to where we need to be. Lord, we have heard your words, and we just ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may go out and share this message that you have given us. Please, Lord, be with us as we continue in this path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.